Welcome to episode 78 of the Bandhive Podcast. You're listening to the Bandhive Podcast, the number one online resource for DIY bands to learn about the music business and touring. If you want to turn your band into a lean, mean touring machine, you're in the right place. Now, let's get this show on the road. It is time for another episode of the Bandhive Podcast. My name is James Cross, and I'm not here with Matt Hose of Alive in Barcelona. Unfortunately, he couldn't join us today, but I have a very special guest, Chad Koal. How are you doing today, man? Pretty good. How about yourself? Glad to hear that, and I'm doing well. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's going to be a really fun episode, I think, because uh, you do something that is kind of like a hidden gem of the music industry called top lining, which is something that I didn't really know about until I heard you started doing it. And now it's like, whoa, there's this whole industry here that a lot of people don't even think about if they're in a band. So I think that's really going to be something interesting for our listeners to hear about from you. Oh, of course. Well, I mean, me personally, like growing up, listening to primarily bands, that was kind of like the the setup was, you know, you either had friends in high school that you that you knew that played different instruments and you formed a band and you yeah, bought a van or a trailer and you hit the road and that was kind of the only thing that I knew. And then uh, a handful of years ago, I um, got introduced to this company. It's f- funny enough. Ha- have Have you spoken to Nino before? I know of Nino, but I can't say I've ever spoken with him. For those who might not know, a good friend of mine, Nino Lucarelli, he's another singer songwriter that's from pretty much the same area as me. We, we grew up playing local shows together in different bands and stuff. And when I was just kind of trying to, I don't know, explore different avenues and check different things out, I had heard what he was doing and he was working with this company out of the Netherlands. That's like this talent agency called Vocal Kitchen. And basically their whole MO is to take the songs that singer songwriters write, like the top lines, which like the vocals, you know, and shop them to different DJs. Because as we've seen over the past, like 10, 15 years, especially a lot of DJs collaborate with vocalists. And so it gives us kind of a unique chance to get our songs placed and get them heard. And it's pretty much the complete invert of being in a band. (laughs) (laughs) I I haven't played a show in like five years and I miss it. I miss it a lot, but there's definitely aspects that I think I prefer with this sort of lifestyle. Yeah. It seems like also, you know, for a while I loved touring. I was on the road for about three years and then I met a girl and was like, I don't want to be on the road all the time anymore. Like I want to stay home. Like, so I I can definitely see how, depending on how different people feel about being away from home all the time, like maybe top lining is the way to go. You can still make music and express yourself, but you don't have that grueling touring schedule all the time. Like that seems like a huge advantage. Yeah, it's definitely an advantage. I feel like it just kind of depends on what your kind of goal is for this, this whole thing. There's people that love to be songwriters and not even sing and, they don't even care if their name's on certain things. They just want to like get paid and and that's it. And then there's people that like want to be the star and want to be, you know, in the spotlight. I feel like I live somewhere kind of in the middle because understand understanding my experience of what it was like to be in a band, that's inevitably going to probably stick with me the rest of my life and kind of inform the choices I make to some degree, for better, for worse. And then being able to write a song in my studio in Phoenix and have some guy in Tokyo working on it is like such a cool experience of just like, you know, from us listening to different bands and artists around the world, like there's a f- different flavor, different cultures in this, this and that. And it's really a fun, exciting thing to see like how they adapt what you wrote, you know? Well, so that brings me to a question, which uh, I, I want to go down the rabbit hole of top lining more. Cause I think there's so much to talk about there. But just before we jump into that, you mentioned that you grew up with Nino in uh, the Phoenix area and you're both in bands. What really got you started in music? Like what piqued that interest? So there's one of my best friends to this day still. His name's Adam Garrity. He lived down the street from me and we, you know, we've grown up together. We've been friends since we were like five and he had a drum set at his house and it was like at the time, it was like this holy grail of drum sets. Like every piece of it was like the best cymbals you could get, the best heads, the best pedals. It was just amazing kit. And he would never let us play it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think I waited until he went to the bathroom one time or like he left to go do something. And I like went in there real quick and I was just like trying to like mess around on it. 
and I I didn't really have any interest in playing musical instruments until that sort of that time. Like my dad played drums, you know, growing up and stuff. So I think that was kind of a little bit maybe like uh in the blood <laughs> a little bit. But uh yeah, I after I played on his kid, I was just kinda like, oh, maybe I should get a you know, a drum set and kind of explore this and see what's up and you know, it kind of evolved from I remember I had this beat up it was so punk. Like <laughs> the the kit Nothing was playable on it. <laughs> the heads were dented in. It looked, it looked like somebody used it as like a shield in battle or something. It was just dented and messed up. But I messed around a little bit on that. And then for that, Chris, that uh, Christmas of that year, I got my first kit. And then I got the next one that I would use when I started touring. And then I have my SJC kit, which I still have behind me. But uh, yeah, it's just been... That was kind of the kickoff point. And then kind of throughout doing more touring and then, you know, kind of the way that that band was, we always had such a hard time landing a vocalist. It was just such a, such a task for us to, to have somebody that worked. And I, when I was, you know, kind of coming up a little bit, I played in a, in a metal band that had a screamer and our singer left. And so it was kind of one of those moments where like, we kind of just passed the mic around the room. <laughs> Whoever had like the voice that people liked the best was the one that was going to be the clean vocalist for that band. And so I ended up, you know, doing the clean vocals for that band, tucked it in the back for a couple of years while I was doing, you know, Farewell, My Love, and then ended up kind of getting to the position to where I was, you know, fully singing for that band. And yeah, it's been a great learning experience. Nice. Well, you know, I, I mentioned earlier uh, before the interview that I have a bit of a nerdy question, <laughs> which was, you were the drummer and the clean vocalist. Did you have a different drummer for your live shows or were you singing while drumming? Well, for a while of doing Farewell, I I did only like harmonies and like backups and stuff. So I, I would sing and do that because I mean, I think one of my biggest inspirations growing up was Aaron Gillespie from Under Oath. And that was always his like staple thing he did. So that was a big inspiration. But when it came time to for me to sing, we did have to have a different drummer live for many obvious reasons i think was it phil collins or something like they put his kit at the front of the stage and that so like like i mentioned it to people and they'd be like why don't you just do the phil collins thing and just like push your kit i'm like i love the whole like being up in people's face and like walking on the crowd and like doing the whole like you know experience yeah the reason i say it's a nerdy question is the sound engineer in me is like that's really difficult to do, you know, like getting the lead vocals to cut through a mix with drums. Like I've seen a couple of bands pull it off, you know, Phil Collins obviously is one with Genesis, but I've seen like some smaller like punk bands. There's one from Montreal. I can't remember their name and a local band as well, but they're like a reggae band, the local band. So it's like not super loud, like a metal band would be playing so that the nerd in me wanted to know. <laughs> I also, when I was researching questions, there was a, a music video where I was watching him like, you never see the drummer's face. He's always cleverly hidden, like behind you or something else or all that. So I was like, I, I have the feeling he didn't play drums live. We went through so many lineup changes that at that point when we were finally like, okay, I'm going to sing for the band. This is going to be how it kind of moves forward. Like it got to the point where everyone we had played drums for us, we were like really good friends with at that point. So it wasn't like we were like, let's tuck him away. It was more so like... <laughs> We've had so many changes. This four is the four that this band is going to continue with. And there's no point in us trying to like brand another person and stuff like that. So that was kind of more of the approach. But yeah, that would that would be a hard thing. It's like, shh, <laughs> you have the, the vocals trying to cut them with the cymbals. Exactly. <laughs> Especially for cleans, like it would get so messy in the mix. But anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about today. Uh, as much as I'd love to nerd out about audio and mixing for an hour, that's not what this episode's about. So just to go through the basics of top lining for people who haven't heard of it before, you know, you mentioned that you are providing the vocals to a DJ when they need a vocalist. What's the process like? You know, if you could go from A to Z on top lining. So there's a couple different processes as far as like the way that we work. One of those is the owner of the company, Alan, he's just developed a really big network of people that he's met throughout the course of time. And they submit their instrumentals to the company. And then the company then sends them to us and says, hey, this person's looking for this sort of thing. And usually what it comes with 
is there's like two different sort of links that we have. We have the links to the tracks, and then we have a link that's like uh, this sheet that usually has like, let's say for instance, that somebody is like a progressive house DJ and they really want to have a song like Calvin Harris or something, then they would put in the reference tracks some songs that they wanted to sound like, or if they want a male or a female, or, you know, if they want us to avoid certain lyrics that are, you know, more this or more that sort of topics. So there's that way of getting the tracks, writing lyrics and a vocal melody over the over the top of it, then recording that, and then sending it back into Vocal Kitchen, and then they pitch it to the, the client. Or there's the method of just kind of doing it very grassroots, and either starting with an acoustic guitar or a basic piano part and coming up with kind of the bare bones idea of what the song is going to be. And then just kind of sending that in and then they could kind of, you know, based off of whatever sort of leaning that it has. Like for instance, if I write a song that's at 150 BPM, like that's way too fast for progressive house music. Maybe they'd want to shop that to like clients that do hard style or clients that do, hip hop or like a modern pop sort of stuff. So those are the two sort of methods that we do. And I think switching back and forth between the two makes it kind of a, a fun and sort of freeing process for me. When you're describing the second version where you start with just the basics, you're not writing with any specific song or beat in mind. That's just a general thing that they will then go and see if there's a fit, they'll pitch it. But you're not writing it knowing like, I'm writing it for this person to consider. Sometimes that's the case because sometimes DJs, rather than approaching him and saying, hey, here's an instrumental, like there might be somebody that's like, hey, I'm looking for some folk inspired stuff. Do you guys have any folk inspired songs? And then he'll either say, yes, we do and and compile a list together for him and send it over. Or he would approach us and be like, hey, they're looking for something that's kind of in this sort of vein. Let's try to see if we can make this for them. So it's a couple of different ways. We try to be as open as we can because like... Music is so interesting in the way that it works. It's it's this sort of thing where I always say it is until it isn't. That's like my my quote that I say all the time because I'm just like, nobody cares about pop punk in the mainstream until they do, right? <laughs> and then nobody cares about emo music and, and live guitars and live drums until they do. And that's just like how things have been over the course of time. And so I try to just keep in mind like, the songwriting structuring of like the way that things go, keep in mind just different aspects to like what makes a, a song a good song and like BPMs and things like that. But I have this thing that I feel like is I'm like pretty married to as far as like any song that I write. And it's I, I feel like I have to put my stamp on it and find some way to disrupt the piece. If I'm writing a pop song that's 128, you know, it's got the kind of four on the floor kick. I'm like, where can I put some interesting lyrics in here that are kind of like very, you know, kind of different because I, I just think that it's, especially when you're writing something that's going to be kind of left behind, you know, for the end of time, I feel like it's, I, I owe it to people to be as a, at my best, which I believe is being fully creative and, you know, injecting as much of myself into the songs I write as possible. Yeah. Kind of uh, break up the monotony, I guess. Like you don't want to write just another regular pop song that, a team of songwriters could have written for who knows what artist you want to stand out and be unique. Yeah, absolutely. Cause the thing that I've not necessarily struggled with this whole time, but it's been definitely a key thing about me is, you know, I didn't grow up listening to just one genre of music. Like I, my mom was very into Michael Jackson. My dad was very into rock music, like journey and stuff of that nature. And so I grew up around that. And then, you know, I was, heavily, heavily inspired by, I guess, the quote unquote emo bands like My Chem or The Used. I wouldn't put AFI in that category, but nonetheless, you know, bands like that. So it bleeds into my writing and it bleeds into my singing because like, this is what I grew up loving. So for a while there, I felt like I was almost having to kind of diminish it a little bit because I'm like, oh, well, this isn't what, you know, Justin Bieber or this person would do. And I'm like, <laughs> well, again, it, it is until it isn't. Like maybe... Like some of the stuff that's on Bieber's new album, like the guitars and stuff, I'm like, you would not catch him doing that stuff like a couple of years ago, but now he is, you know. And if you if you're constantly fixated on writing music that sounds like what's out right now and that's it, it's gonna make stuff obsolete. So I just try to like, I don't know, 
just follow what my gut tells me to do and just trust that that's the way. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Like right now, you know, MGK's pop punk album came out, what, about six months ago? And there's been such an influx of local artists <laughs> who are trying to sound exactly like MGK. It's like, well, if you like that, do something similar, but put your own twist on it. If you just rip it off entirely, that's no one's going to listen to you because they can listen to the real thing. They can go listen to MGK. And that happens like, you know, 10 years ago, it was, uh, or maybe not even 10 years ago, five years ago, everyone was trying to rip off the black keys. Like there's every time there's a big new sound, everyone tries to do that. And no one does it as well as the original. Anytime that Bring Me the Horizon tries to do anything. <laughs> the thing I always said was, I was like, when Bring Me the Horizon drops an album, the entire scene changes every single time. <laughs> even Architects, that one, that one got me. Like I, I love the new Bring Me stuff more than their old stuff. But when Architects went from the brutal sounds that they had on Lost Forever, Lost Together, and then they put out a song that sounds like New Bring Me, I was just like, really? It's that kind of thing, though, where, where like, that's what's sort of hard, is that, like, how do you as a band decide if that's going to work for you? If you're going to be the, the band that's going to be able to make that work and uh, sound sonically different, or if, or if it's just not going to connect well. Like, I think Under Oath, on their recent record... I loved that album. I thought it was so good. They did such a good job, in my opinion, of sort of marrying the radio rock sort of world with kind of where they came from. But it's hit or miss, you know? Yeah, and it, it is kind of the thing that any of the bands that are still around from the mid-2000s, like The Used has done it, Silverstein has done it. I mean, A Beautiful Place to Drown was one of the top albums of the year it came out. I can't remember if it was 2019 or 2020, but I love that album. Like, that's a great album. And it sounds so different, but it's amazing, you know? And um, they were definitely inspired by Bring Me the Horizon, I think, but it wasn't a straight ripoff of Bring Me. And that's what I think to me was like, hey, I like the Bring Me record. This sounds kind of like it, but it also still sounds like Silverstein, like meeting in the middle, kind of. But before I take us way off topic here, nerding out about music, <laughs> <laughs> is there a big difference between writing songs for your own band versus writing for top lining assuming you're you know starting from scratch rather than you're writing over someone else's beat there's definitely less of a brand because when you're when you're in a band like let's say i don't know i'm gonna say afi because they're, they're on the brain so you have afi you say the name you get immediately a visual you get nearly impossible to play bass parts you get jade's you know very tasteful and jangly guitar parts you know with his with his leads and his effects and stuff and you have Adam is just so solid. And then you have Davey with his a thousand isms. <laughs> but with a band, you have such a tight brand that like, that's why the, you see so oftentimes that like fans, they'll be like, this band sold out or this band changed or this or that. Like there's, there's less leeway with what you can do, especially the deeper you get in your career, I believe. So with me, like being in the band, like, like our band was like, we called ourselves a theatrical rock band. So that was kind of, our mo so like we're not going to go in there and write like a dan and shay song because that doesn't fit the brand and even if it was a great song like you wouldn't catch us writing that because it doesn't fit the brand in doing things like that sometimes i don't know that you're always making the best choices like, like when, you, when you're trying to fit like a narrative and that's one of the things i love about this is like i'll love to listen to a dan and shay song i, I also want to go listen to like kanye west or you know something that's totally the invert and I think this allows me to kind of express myself to the fullest degree and not have to worry about the specifics of it. Because although my name is on these songs and like I might even sing on them and have like a featuring credit or a main artist credit, like it's not, it's just not the same. It's just not the same sort of process as like if it was just my name on it. Yeah. It's kind of like, it gives you more creative freedom to go do what feels right for the song rather than what feels right for the brand, I guess. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. The thing we always say is that the song is king. One of the things I struggled with a lot over the course of me writing songs was, you know, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I'm married. Like, I, I just, there's just so many things that, like, it doesn't really supply for this, like, crazy lyric. I'm like, I watch, <laughs> I watch Goosebumps, <laughs> I eat popcorn, I play with my dog, and I'm married, and I don't, I don't party. Like, it's just, it's, it's not this crazy thing, you know? So I was like, I think it was like last year when I was really taking another look at my songwriting and my lyric writing. And I was like, 
kind of saying it, I was kind of inspired by like Elton John or somebody like that. That's like such a storyteller, or even Bob Dylan, like somebody that like that. And I was like, I don't have to always tell my story, even if I'm singing it. Like the most you're gonna get is some guy, some troll online on like YouTube being being like, why is he saying that he's getting you know, messed up on alcohol if he doesn't drink. I'm like, I'm just telling somebody's story because that's the thing about songwriting that I believe that I owe people the the most as a songwriter is if I wrote only lyrics that resonated with me and that's it, I'm only hitting one specific person. Whereas maybe I would write a song that's like about, you know, relapsing on drugs or doing something like that or, or partying too hard or things like that. And somebody hears that and they're like, damn, that's me. I can relate with that. And so I, I found a lot of freedom and power in that. And just realizing that like, if I'm telling a story in these lyrics and it's not mine, it's okay. Like let people judge you if they may about being the one that's singing the words that you can't necessarily relate with. But I don't know. I see myself as kind of a little bit of a filter. You know what I mean? A, f- a filter for, um, for the public to kind of just take my discography and rip it apart and kind of see what parts fit them and, Hopefully I can help some people out there. Yeah. You know, I think that's a great tip for songwriters. Um, That brings two examples to mind. One is uh, around here, we have a great local artist by the name of Troy Millette. He writes a lot of songs and he's, uh, he'll joke about it all day long. He's also hilarious on stage, but uh, he'll joke about the fact that like half his songs are about girls. He just imagined like they're not actual people in any way. And he's just like, you know, what could have been like, and he'll, he'll write a song about that. Or he'll write a song about like the time he and his best friend started beating each other up (laughs) in like their college quad because they were fake wrestling and then one of them punched the other one too hard. And like he turned it into a song about his hometown, like stuff like that. And, you know, you can base it on real things, but you don't have to be literal about it. You know, it's not like you're writing a book report. You're you're writing a song. You can be creative, which leads me to um, Better Man by Pearl Jam. Is it Eddie Vedder, I think, is their singer? Better Man was about his childhood, but he changed it so much. Like three quarters of the song is stuff that never actually happened, but it was inspired by his childhood. And, um, you know, you know I, I saw like a 10 minute documentary on the song last week. So I'll put that in the show notes at bandhive.rocks slash 78. If anyone else wants to go watch that, I definitely recommend it. It's a great little YouTube documentary. But I think that's a great example of what you're saying is like, you can go out there and write a song and, uh, you know, at any point, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not a songwriter. This is just what I'm hearing from, like, other artists. But you can go out there and write a song, and it doesn't have to be something that's happened to you. Like, it can be whatever you want it to be, because that's creative freedom. Like, you know, I, I don't think Van Gogh actually saw the stars in Starry Night that way. He just said, hey, I'm going to paint it this way. Like, you can do that with a song. The thing that it kind of goes back to is a really big issue that the world has in general is feeling like the things we create or the ways that we dress or the ways that we look, you know, just anything that's involving like something personal from us, we feel like we need to get somebody else's stamp of approval on it in order to go forward with it. And it's this horrible, horrible flaw in in the way that we are and everybody's guilty of it so i'm not speaking from this position of being like oh that's not me i feel sorry for these people like that's totally me you know like before you post something on instagram you're like how many likes is this gonna get like what sort of captions should this have and you know when you let that influence your art you're just diminishing it i actually had a thought today when i was at the gym i was like thinking about songwriting and i was like you know imagine you write this song that you love And everybody you show just loves it. They're like, this is a great song, you know, for whatever reason. Maybe the lyrics are good. The melody's good. Maybe it just all connects. You show some other guy and he says, this is awful. You should do something more like this or less like this. All this sucks. So you're then put in a position to where you either cater to that or you stick to what you're doing. Because the same reasons why somebody might hate you might be the same reasons why another might love you. And... It's a really big decision that you have to make as an artist, you know, when you're writing songs and stuff, because like the top lining business is like any other business, especially within the entertainment industry where, you know, you're having a bunch of highs and everything's going really great. And then maybe you have a little bit of a low time. Maybe it's mediocre that it's the biggest point you've ever had. And then you're back down again. It's kind of like this. And I believe that during those times is when you're really, really tested your, your will of what you're going to commit to and what ideals that you're going to believe in. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, I would just say to anybody out there creating art, like I, I, I said the other day, I said, artists, ask yourself, do you want to change the scene or do you want to blend in with it? Because it's a big point, you know, there's not really necessarily a wrong answer. It's just kind of, what do you want? Like, what's your intention? Yeah. I definitely agree with that, but I also want to push back on it just a little bit, because if you think about the bands who have made it, like, you know, My Chemical Romance or AFI, they changed the scene. They didn't blend in. They went above and beyond and changed it. And that's why they are who they are, you know? Like, there's tons of other bands I love, like, um, you know, Bayside. Great band and amazingly talented, but I would say that nothing that they have ever done would really be considered groundbreaking. Like, they're amazing, but there's nothing really super unique about them. Aside from maybe Anthony's vocals, like he has a voice like no one else. And, you know, they've achieved success, but not on the level that AFI or My Cam or even The Used has. And I think that's like a good example of, you can still make a living with music by doing what other people do if you put in the work, but I think it's really difficult to get like number one on the billboard charts, you know, not that people even really care about that so much anymore. It's cool. You know, it's awesome like when people do it, but it's not like it was 15 years ago when that actually meant like, dude, you're huge. Now it's like, oh, cool. Like you had a bunch of people streaming you like, nice. You got a few cents. The time when we had a uh, December Underground is like a that was a number one album, right? If I remember correctly, or, or was it two on the Billboard 200? Yeah, I think it hit number one. People you speak to nowadays have no fathomable idea of just how batshit crazy that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First of all, like, I think things are changing a little bit. So I think we're going to see, you know, bands having more success, especially with, you know, artists like MGK kind of leading the charge with the sound and stuff. But I remember seeing that. And it was such a cool time because you'd flip on VH1, you'd watch promiscuous by nelly furtado and then you'd watch miss murder <laughs> they were sandwiched together there was no mercy with like trying to adhere to uh, a certain crowd it was beyonce and then it was gerard way you know it was just these things that are just so oppositional but just like we're sandwiched together so i i think it's uh it should give everyone a lot of hope i think especially if you're out there trying to grind it out on the road and do the whole band thing that like there is potential for the genre still. You just cannot adhere to the rules. Because that's the thing that I think both bands and artists struggle with a lot of the time. Is thinking that we have any sort of play in what happens with our career. How many bands have said, we're going to change this scene and we're going to be the biggest band in the world and have actually done it? <laughs> and it's, it's not, it's not to, to slant that mindset because I think that mindset is wonderful. It's, it's a great driving force. But bands like Mike Cam and The Used and stuff, man, those are just like four or five guys in a garage that were just unique individuals. And how they saw the world and the music that they made was undeniable. And it's it's one of those things where it, it irritates us as creatives when when we want to we want to recreate that magic. We want to we want to have that moment for ourselves. But the thing we got to realize is the only way to improve our chances with putting a stamp on this world is to just be ourselves to the fullest degree. Yeah, I, I want to add to that, but real quick, I looked up December Underground. It debuted at number one <laughs> with 182,000 copies, 182,000 copies in the first week. That's so good. I was one of those kids. Dude, I had no idea how, how, how things worked back then, like for whatever reason, I wasn't on the internet a whole lot. And so I remember I got my wisdom teeth pulled out and I was sitting on the couch and they had the making of Miss Murder on all day long it it was just over and over and over and over so i was just sitting watching this and that's how i discovered them and i was like okay cool the making of videos on vh1 so the album must be out right and so i went to best buy and i was like do you guys have this album like this doesn't come out for like a month <laughs> <laughs> i remember it came out on 666 though that was really tight yeah it's amazing like afi was so regular with the three years three months between albums for the longest time and then they broke that and now it's been like four years five years it's like no, no, it, it got worse. You should have been releasing more music. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I think what you were saying a second ago before I brought up the stats there is really interesting because it's that magic of making music that's unique, but that people connect with. So on last episode, number 77, we had Brian Mazzaferi of I Fight Dragons on the show. Uh, if anyone wants to hear that, great interview. I definitely recommend it. It's at bandhive.rocks slash 77. And one of the things that he said was when he was first starting out with his music career, 
he was making the music that he wanted to make that he thought was going to, you know, blow up and he wanted to really push his music. But then as soon as he realized that if he made music that people want while still staying true to what he wanted to do, that's when things started taking off for them. It was that shift of you make the music you want to make, but you don't set your goals to change the world. You set your goals to change people's lives. That's essentially what he was saying. And like, that's how a band takes off. And you know, I Fight Dragons isn't as big as The Used or any of those bands, but they've consistently been putting out albums that are entirely funded by their fans. Like, you know, they're, they're not full-time artists, but they can dump 40 grand into an album and be like, yeah, our fans paid for all this. Like, we didn't have to pay anything out of pocket. And to me, like, that's better than like a major label advance in most cases. Because like a lot of times, the smaller artists, if you get a, a major label deal, it'll be like, oh, you know, here's like 10K to record. And it's like, okay, that covered half our costs. <laughs> yeah. Now we have to pay the other half out of pocket and you own the masters to the album. Like, ouch. Nowadays, especially with like how massive SoundCloud and like all those rappers that came out of that sort of scene are, like, I just don't think fans care anymore, man. I feel like back in the day, like when even I was doing the band thing, it was like such a like, like a street cred, like stamp of approval to be like, <laughs> like my band's on Fearless or my band's on Rise or like th- there was just a handful of of those labels that were kind of the the labels that, you know, with the tent on, at Warp Tour that you kind of just looked at and you were just like striving to kind of be like that. And as, again, it's not a slant to any of that because that's still a great, a great route for a lot of great artists out there. But I think that it's not necessarily a necessity anymore, especially if you can find some funding. Yeah, that makes me think of another example that I used last week, which is The Main. And I think they're from Phoenix too, aren't they? Oh my God. Yes, they, dude, they, they, they're like, that band is such a mystery to me because they, they consistently get more independent and bigger. And I'm just like trying to figure out like what's going on. Like, cause, cause again, we like, we can't accept that like maybe it's just like meant to be, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'll tell you the the number one thing is they're smart. And the number two thing is they work hard. They were out there on Warp Tour and I've told this story on the podcast a bunch, but they were playing, I think it was 2016. They were on the main stage of Warp Tour and they were out in the lines before gates opened every single day. I did not see any other major label bands or main stage bands doing that. They'd send out, you know, the merch guy or the merch girl and they'd sell CDs, but the band would not be out in lines selling their own CDs, signing stuff for their fans. That's hustle. And then for the smart aspect for the album that came out two or three years ago, I can't remember which one it was, but they actually uh, had the opportunity for every single one of their fans to get their name in the liner notes of the deluxe version of the album. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I remember that. That's genius. Because <laughs> you know what? Anyone who has their name in there who entered is going to be like, oh, now I got to buy it and make sure they actually put me in there. So if they get 10,000 fans to sign up for that, guess what? They just sold 10,000 extra copies. Like, those little things that, first of all, giving fans the opportunity to be in the liner notes, that's huge. Like, that's one of the things I Fight Dragons does. If you support them on Patreon at the right level, they'll put you in the liner notes. And so the main made it free knowing that, hey, if we do this, people are going to go buy it. Like those little things that add so much value to a fan's life because like who wouldn't want to be in their favorite band's liner notes? Piece of history. Yeah, exactly. And it's something that costs practically nothing to set up and print. Like you might have to print a few extra pages of a booklet that cost you, you know, let's say an extra 20 cents per copy, but you sell an extra 10,000 copies. Like, dude, that's amazing. So just having... Artists like that who are so conscious of what they do, I think is amazing. It also is making me realize how much bigger the Phoenix music scene is than I realized. Like you have Jimmy World, you have The Main, you're there. There's so many bands out of Phoenix, which I feel like it's almost like a sleeper city. Like everyone thinks of LA, Nashville, New York, sometimes Chicago. And then there's Phoenix. Like there's big bands coming out of there. And that was probably like why, another reason why you know, I would want to form a band in the first place because like when I, like there was, there was waves, right? There's waves of like different eras. Cause they, we had, you, you know, Jimmy world, Chester Bennington was from Phoenix. Oh, no way. He had a local band called gray days that my dad like saw at like a mall one time. <laughs> so we had that sort of era. And then when I was coming up, we had 
sort of two different things happening at the same time. We had Bless the Fall, Greeley Estates, The Word Alive, like that side of like metal, Job for a Cowboy, Knights of the Abyss. And then we had the other side, which was the total invert, which was like the Somerset, the main, the format, which, you know, a couple of those members ended up becoming fun to anybody who is is curious. But yeah, it's just, it's was such a, a change of pace was another big one. But yeah, we, um, we had it going on for a good minute. There's, pro- there's definitely probably still bands out there killing it and coming up and stuff, but I, my, my radar is just a little off, but yeah, it was a it, cool time to be coming up and playing shows and yeah, just a really great local scene, man. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And you know, as much as I said, I didn't want to sidetrack nerding out about music. Let's do it. Here I am having sidetracked us so much, but it, it's like, it's all still good information, you know, like what you're saying about the split in the scenes, what that makes me think of is people talk about like, oh, you know, like the XYZ city music scene sucks, but there's like 20 different scenes in your local scene. Like just because, you know, the eighties hardcore punk scene might be dead. Doesn't mean that, you know, the, uh, pop scene is dead. Like maybe you're just in the wrong city for the type of music you play. Like there's a scene for most genres out there. It just depends on finding it. Totally, man. Well, and that that's people tend to be really dramatic (laughs) and they're like, I want to play this like crust punk stuff and it doesn't exist. So this scene sucks, <laughs> you know? I mean, dude, like when my band was first coming up in the, in the scene, everybody hated us <laughs> as far as, as like, like the local scene because we weren't metal. We weren't wearing the basketball shorts and the V-necks <laughs> and we weren't pop. You know what I mean? Like we looked like Black Veil Brides or Motley Crue or something. You had branding. I know. God forbid, right? <laughs> but... No, it's uh, it's one of those things where if the scene isn't what you wish for it to be, like, if anything, that's tight. Like, build it yourself. Because, like, the emo, like, punk rock, post-hardcore scene that Warp Tour ended up, you know, becoming so infamous for, like, kind of housing, that started by handfuls of bands. There's so many podcasts I listen to, and I realize that, like, there's so many hubs like these bands like were friends and they came up together and stuff. I'm just like, what? These guys know each other and they're from the same place. And it's, I don't know, man, like a lot of talent out there. There's a lot of potential to push, uh, to push new, uh, genres out there. So absolutely. And I think that's also what you're mentioning there is that when the artists come up, they bring along the people that they know, like, and trust. That's how to make connections. You don't necessarily have to make the best music. You have to make good music and you have to, be trustworthy and be friends with the right people. Like, and I'm not saying be fake friends. I'm saying like you genuinely have to befriend the right people. You can't fake it. Like people can smell that a mile away. And if you do it right and you befriend the right people genuinely, then that's great. But if you don't, it's going to be a rough ride. Yeah, absolutely. If, if it even turns into a ride. <laughs> yeah. You might get a flat tire leaving the driveway. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. Well, hey, I want to pivot back to uh, top lining here because there's a couple more questions I want to get in and I also you know, want to be respectful of your time. But one thing I think that is going to be on a lot of artists' minds are, you know, hey, I'm in a band, but you know, we're, we're not full-time as a band yet. Can I still do top lining as a side hustle? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, it, that question kind of really depends on the agency you're working with and the genre that you're in and what sort of deal that you sign. Like, so in this instance, I'm exclusive with Vocal Kitchen. So they are my exclusive publisher. And that's a lot of, that's like where like 90% of my like time that I dedicate to this sort of stuff goes. But I mean, you can always do like, there's different deals you can do where it's like a song to song basis, or it's kind of like slightly dipping your foot in the water, but it really just kind of comes down to the genre itself, because I'm very familiar with top lining in the world that I'm in, but then there's probably a, a, a world of top lining that's like a different genre of music that I'm totally like not as well versed in. But that's the thing that's so great about top lining is Imagine if you were to try to be in like five bands, like that's, that's a recipe for disaster. You know, a lot of what being in a band is, is being with the band in their local city and practicing with them and collaborating like in a, in a real way. 
Whereas with top lining, you can do that. The option's still there. I've done that before and it's wonderful. But you're not limited to it. I mean, like, dude, during COVID, we had no choice but to do the Zoom sessions. And up until that point, I had really only written with my great friends Nino and then uh, Bryant Powell. I don't know if you ever met my friend Tyler Blinn, but he, he's another um, another great friend of mine. But those were, those were like kind of like my AZ crew of like people that I'd write with. And then after COVID, it was just only Zoom. And I found myself writing with people from Germany and from, you know, the, the UK and the Netherlands and just different places. And I'm like, dude, this kind of kicks ass. Like there was, there's this manager guy I was speaking to the other day and he was talking about how his clients like are like, I'm waiting till COVID's over to do like any sessions because I, I don't want to do Zoom and this and that. And I was like, dude, like I've had such a good time because here's the thing. It's so efficient, man. You call them up, you block out a specific amount of time, hour or two, you get the song done, you hop off. And then a lot of the times I'll go record it right there and then start producing. So to loop back around, because I, I also got sidetracked. If you're in a band and you want to do top lining on the side, you absolutely can do that. It's just a matter of knowing what genre that you want to try to dip your feet into and just kind of doing the best to balance everything out and how much time you want to give to each thing. Yeah. First of all, just the remote sessions thing. That's amazing. And I've seen so many people do remote production for bands, like people in my community of engineers. It's truly amazing what you can do. People will be like working from Toronto, you know, and the producers in Nashville or vice versa. Like stuff like that is amazing. And it's something that we couldn't do 10 years ago because the internet was so slow. And now it's like normal and expected. There's a, a new technology. I sound like a dinosaur talking about like this. <laughs> There's an app or something that exists now. I was watching an interview with Mark Hoppus and he was talking about how they're working on the new Blink record with John Feldman and how you can literally open a Pro Tools session and they're both in the exact same session writing at the same time. And so so John will be like, you know, hey, here's this guitar riff. And then Mark will be like, okay, let me track it real quick. Nah, 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 nah. There it is in the Pro Tools session. I'm like, dude, that is so game changing because 90% of the time what you're booking for is the studio. If you don't need the studio anymore, boom. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if anything, this is the time where bands should be the most stoked because like, there's so many little hacks to like just so many aspects of it. There's plugins you can put on your guitars that like legitimately sound like Eddie Van Halen. It's like amp. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just like, it's just a click away, you know, it's just about being open-minded to it, I think. Yeah. And you know, on that note, you mentioned that the manager didn't want to do any recording. I've seen so many artists who are saying, you know, while COVID's going on, it just doesn't seem right to, you know, post on social media and put out content and this and that. It's like, if you don't want to post, that's fine. But all the other artists who are posting and are putting out content, they're going to be 10 miles ahead of you by the time COVID is over because they've been working this whole time and you've been sitting home watching Netflix. Like, and you know, nothing wrong with that. But if you want to sit home and watch Netflix, then that's your career is sitting at home and watching Netflix. <laughs> that's like, that's where your career is going. Anyway, as we wrap things up here, first of all, thank you so much for taking out the time to uh, to talk about Vocal Kitchen and music in general. This has been such a blast. What advice would you give to a singer or songwriter who wants to get started with top lining? Where should they start? Well, here comes the plug, guys. Here comes the plug. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if anybody's ever interested in doing anything in top lining, I believe that the company I'm with, Vocal Kitchen, does an amazing job at this. The amount of artists that I speak to that are struggling to get their songs heard and struggling to feel like they can get their their talents out there and stuff is is immense and i've i've seen through this process that you know granted this is not like my sole piece of income yet it's been such a blessing to be able to create something from the comfort of, of my house and sell it to these you know these clients that they have and it's such a fun process man and it's a cool way to get out there. I feel like this is the new way because, you know, in this sort of climate that we're in, I'm not releasing Chad Kowal solo music. I'm releasing Chad Kowal with the DJ. And a lot of the times those DJs are signed with the label and they have their connections to playlist placement and label marketing push and, you know, content creation and that sort of stuff. So 
I mean, if anybody's interested in in top lining, there's definitely a lot of companies out there that might be for you, but I would definitely check out. It's vocalkitchen.com. We're always looking for new vocalists to join the roster, new singer-songwriters that can bring, you know, something wonderful to the table. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And then if people want to learn more about you, where should they go? It will be uh, at Chad Kowal on all social media. All right, Chad. Well, thanks again for joining us. This has been a blast and I hope you have an awesome rest of your day. You as well, man. Thanks for having me. That does it for this episode of the Bandhive podcast. Thanks so much to each and every one of you for tuning in and listening to learn about your music career. Super big thanks as well to Chad Qual for coming on the show to talk about top lining and vocal kitchen. And of course, also all the amazing side conversations we had. And, you know, I know I'm so guilty of sidetracking this one a lot, but Chad and I came up not in the same scene geographically, but listening to a lot of the same bands. So being able to talk about different things we've seen in this world, this genre of artists doing innovative things, that was so much fun. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what you all think of this episode because there's so much to learn. You know, I keep mentioning the main over and over. This is probably like the third or fourth time I've mentioned them, but they really have such a good strategy and business model. It really works for them. It's paying off. And, you know, same thing for bands like Ballyhoo, who we talked to back on episode 48. They've been doing that for such a long time, and it's finally paying off for them. You can find that at bandhive.rocks slash 48 if you want to listen to it. And, of course, the same for the interview last week with Brian from iFight Dragons, number 77, at bandhive.rocks slash 77. Another artist who really is showing that they've taken some outside-the-box ideas to make what they want to do work and pay for their career, essentially. So it's really useful to think outside of the box like this. And maybe top lining is one of those things where you think outside of the box. If you're not constantly writing or touring, if you have some downtime that you want to fill with more songwriting, vocal kitchen or top lining through another agency might be a really good move for you. So I definitely encourage you to check it out. Thanks again for listening. We really appreciate it. And if you have any episode requests, any topic requests, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at bandhive.rocks on Instagram, or you can email me directly, james at bandhive.rocks. That's the domain name is bandhive.rocks. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back with another new episode next Tuesday at 6 a.m. Eastern time. Until then, have a great week, stay safe, and of course, as always, keep rocking.